Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin today's service with hymn number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King, verses 1 through 5. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice with us and sing. Oh, praise ye, alleluia. Oh, brother sun with golden beam. Oh, sister moon with silver gleam. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye. All creatures ye sustain, oh praise ye, alleluia. Thou rising morn and praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a voice, oh praise ye, oh praise ye. Sister water flowing clear, make music for thy Lord to hear. Alleluia, alleluia. Oh, brother fire who lights the night, providing warmth, enhancing sight. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye. Blessings on our way. Alleluia, alleluia. All flowers and fruits that in thee grow, let them God's glory also show. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye. Take your part, oh, praise ye, alleluia. Ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on him cast your care. Oh, praise ye, oh, praise ye, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Welcome everybody to Kansas Avenue. It's great to see a good group here on Labor Day weekend. It's hard to believe Labor Day weekend is upon us, isn't it? So good to see everybody here. I was going to say all your smiling faces, but I'm just going to say to all your masked faces. <laughs> but it's a delight to be with you this morning on this, the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, I believe. Maybe the 13th on the program. Anyway, we're, we're after Pentecost. That much we do know. And... We have a couple of announcements, but first of all, I wanted to, Angie to tell us about a new addition to her family. What can you tell us, Angie? Well, her name is Harper Elizabeth Deese, and she was born on Tuesday the 1st. Is that right? Yes. I can't remember. It's been a whirlwind. Okay. <laughs> and she's great. I think there's a picture of her maybe up on the uh, screen. No? Yes? There was earlier? There was. Okay. Good. Yep. Everybody's doing yeah, great. Yeah. So everybody's doing She's beautiful. Good. She, I think she looks very much like Josie when she was born. <laughs> well, congratulations to Josie and her family and to you and your family and all of the extended family here. This is awesome. We're always so thrilled to see a new one come into our world and so healthy and beautiful. It's a blessing. It's a miracle of God. It really is. We just had our third grandchild here about a month ago today, as a matter of fact, it was. And so she's now one month old and just changing constantly. What a blessing little children are. We're so grateful. Thank you again. 
for sharing that, Angie. I have a couple of announcements I'd like to share with you this morning. One is that our administrative council meeting will be at 6 o'clock this Wednesday. We're switching it up in September and October. There's a couple of schedule conflicts. I'm hoping this will work okay. And so we might even switch it up in November as well. So at any rate, just bear with us as we go through the process here. But we're going to meet at 6 o'clock on Wednesday, this Wednesday, coming up the 9th. And we're going to have a pastor parish relations meeting. I think we're going to put that off to the side. I'll be here early. If anybody wants to talk to me, I'll be down here probably drinking a cup of coffee. You're welcome to come visit with me. Love that. But anyway, just to let you know that's going on. Then a week from today, we're going to try to launch this new adventure called the... It's a, it's a video Sunday school class we're doing that's based out of this book on this thing right here, In Pursuit of Jesus. Now, this is from Our Daily Bread Ministries. I think it'll be really good. This is about a pastor named Rasul Berry from Brooklyn, New York, and he's going to go to different parts of the world. He's going to go to New York City, which is where he's, he's a pastor in Brooklyn. He's going to go to Singapore, Sweden, Argentina, South Africa, Galilee, and Jerusalem. He's going to talk to, bit, to people about what they think of Jesus, who is Jesus to them, and it's really well done. It lasts about 25 minutes, and we might have a little discussion afterwards. If not, it'll it'll be about the time we normally all start arriving. So if you want to come in a little bit early next week, we'll get a roll around, what, around 10, 15 or so, hopefully, something like that. And you can go on to the Our Daily Bread website and see these videos. They're on there, but you can also find them there. But it's really good. I've already watched the first one. Once you watch it, you want to come back to all of it. It's really contemporary. They're brand new. They're not something like, you know, nothing wrong with stuff back from the 60s and 70s, but this is like just fresh out of the can. So I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and let's see, beyond that, again, we're continuing to do our daily devotionals on our kaumc.church website. You can listen to those starting on the 14th, that's a week from tomorrow, we're going to start in with a 10-minute Bible study every week. So every every day, I should say, we're going to be looking at Galatians. So that's going to be a little different than me just sitting there talking about what's going on, just sort of sharing with you, which I've enjoyed doing, but I thought it's time to switch it up a little bit. So starting this next Monday, not tomorrow, but the following week, we'll be launching into a Bible study. 10 minutes is all it is, and then we go each day. We'll just go a few verses at a time. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. And we do have a couple of other announcements regarding prayer concerns. We want to keep Kathy Baining in our prayers for continued healing for her and that God's presence would be with her and her physicians and all the medical personnel. We also have this prayer request from Joanne Dunsworth, who's having some challenges with her family. Apparently there's some quarantining going on. Of course, they have children in their household, and they're having to do some of this remote learning. Of course, really everybody is at 501 right now. But certainly we want to keep Joanne in our prayers. And then she said there's a praise report that Claude is can, has no more cancer and no more chemotherapy at this time. So we praise God for that report from Joanne. We've missed Joanne because I've thought about her frequently. There's a few others I've thought about and I've tried to call, but I can't get a hold of them. So I'm hoping they'll resurface at some point down the road. At any rate, those are the announcements I have. We also want to draw your attention to some birthdays. Jennifer is... Having a birthday, Lashana Weikert, and so is Debbie Gasper coming up on a birthday. Happy birthday to all of you, and then happy anniversary for Scott and Angie. So we do uh, wish you guys special days this, on these anniversaries and birthdays. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our gracious God, we do thank you for this time that we can come together where we just separate out of the world now for this hour, Lord, and help us to really be open to your word today, Lord, that you would give to us through the scriptures, through the message, and through the music. Help us to be attentive to what it is you want each one of us to hear, Lord. And now, Lord, we ask that you would lead us in the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have another song at this time. Page 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It's a beautiful song. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies grow. 
Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure and bounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, and to every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh, breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit, let us find that second rest. Take away our bent to sinning, Alpha and Omega be, end of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Be we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray Glory in thy perfect love. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory. Till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Amen. Beautiful. I uh, noticed that song was written by Charles Wesley. That's the brother of John Wesley, as you all know, one of the founders of the Methodist Church that we're benefits beneficiaries of even now today and uh, Charles Wesley was a prolific hymn writer and some beautiful songs that he has written so that was one there that I write on this hymnal this is kind of my main one and I put notes down on when we sang these songs we don't sing the same songs all the time that's the first time we've sung that song since I've been with you so there you go if you thought it sounded something new it did it was new for at least for us for, for, for uh, since I've been with you anyway so we always like to see who wrote these hymns. I think that's fascinating. And this was written in 1747, so 200 and about 73 years ago, I think, if I got my math right. Let's do our scripture readings today, shall we? Psalm 149 to start us with today. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands, who execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, who execute on them the judgment decreed. This is the glory of of his faithful ones, praise the Lord. And now on to Romans 13, verses 8 to 14. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
make no provision for the faith for the flesh to gratify its desires. In our gospel reading today from Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20, it says, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I and there among them. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture. We will read another scripture in just a moment. It'll be from Exodus, but kind of to set that that uh, that scripture up, we have another song today with uh, Angie and Joe. Go down Moses, page 448. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Saith the Lord, bold Moses said, Let my people go. If not, I'll smite your firstborn dead. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. my people go. No more shall they in bondage toil. Let my people go. Let them come out with Egypt's spoil. Let my people go. Go down, Moses. to give some applause to these folks. That was an awesome job. 
no rehearsal on that, was there? No rehearsal on that. That was awesome. That was I was watching Joe playing that. That's not the easiest song to play. Thanks for hitting that curveball I threw you. <laughs> That's a great song. It fits in today so well, but thank you for that. I love that. Something different. Let's read our scripture passage for today. It's found in Exodus, of course, chapter 12 and verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of the month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And tell the whole congregation of Israel on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male you may take from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts in the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on, your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both humans, beings, and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word here today. We are embarking on a new series that we are going to call... Through the wilderness. I like that idea, through the wilderness, as opposed to in the wilderness. Because when I say through the wilderness, that tells me I'm going to get to the other side. If I'm in the wilderness, I may wonder if I'm ever going to get out. Today we find ourselves, in some regards, in the wilderness. Sure, we are here in North Topeka. We're around houses and buildings and streets and businesses. But make no mistake, it is the wilderness. What with everything that's been going on in our world this year? You know, the wilderness can be a scary place, I suppose, unless you have someone with you. Someone who has been in that wilderness before. Someone who knows the lay of the land. Somebody who knows where he's going and how he's going to get there. Someone to lead you. Then it's not so scary after all. Because we put our trust in the one who's leading us. We only have one job. One simple thing that we need to do. That's to follow the one who's leading us. It's one thing to have somebody that leads us, and we know we've got a leader, but we still have to follow that leader. You know, we could wander off on our own. We could be distracted by something off to the side, and the leader's gone on ahead of us, and we'll catch up later, and we run over here, and we can't find the leader when we get back. What happened? Leaders disappeared because we didn't follow the leader like we were supposed to. Today we are going to hear about the most special night possibly in the history of the Jewish nation, the children of Israel, because it's the night that they were 
going to be finally set free. And to set the stage for this, we've got to remember that God had already made a promise to the children of Israel a long time ago, centuries. And that promise came to Abraham that he was going to give them a very special land of Canaan. It's going to be the promised land. And they were going to have this land as their inheritance. It's interesting to me, when we think about the word promise, it's always in the future, isn't it? If I promise to do something for you, it's in the future. If I was to say to the date of my wife, I'm, I'm going to promise to marry you, it would seem a bit strange because we're coming up on 25 years of marriage. Y'all don't need to clap. I'm just telling you. And she gets all the applause for putting up with me, trust me. But we don't promise for something that's already happened. Here was this promise that God made. And things just didn't look like they were coming together quite like maybe everybody would have thought because there were so many difficulties. You know, the motto of the state of Kansas is ad astra per aspera, through the, to the stars through difficulties. It's sort of what happens in this scripture with the children of Israel. They're going to get to the promised land, but it's going to be through a lot of difficulties. So we have Abraham who had to believe God and to trust him and to have faith in him going out into a true wilderness. He had no idea where he was going, but he believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness, and he followed God out into the middle of some place. He had no idea where he was going. And God took him outside one night of his tent and said, look up to the stars. You're going to have descendants that are going to rival the number of stars you see in the sky. Abraham really didn't bat an eye. I mean, he's recognizing he's about 100 years old at the time, and his wife's past childbearing years. How's this going to happen? They don't have any children. And yet God made it happen. And then we know that Isaac came along. Isaac is all of a sudden being led up the mountain by Abraham to be a sacrifice, to obey God. And guess what happened then? God said, I believe that you have faith, Abraham. I'm not going to make you do away with your son. I just wanted to test you here. Isaac then carries the mantle from that point on. He has several children, one of whom is named Jacob. Jacob then inherits the promise. Jacob has children of his own. And that leads us to Joseph, Jacob's favorite son. It was the firstborn son between him and Rachel. And then Joseph gets sold into slavery. And where's the promise now? God hasn't forgotten. And sure enough, Joseph gets elevated to second in command in Egypt. And as a result of that, all of Joseph's family gets to come into Egypt and get the royal treatment. They get treated great for a long, long time until finally some of the successors to Pharaoh realize, I don't know who this Joseph was, but I don't know where all these Israelites are coming from. Man, we are getting overrun with these people. Just like God had told Abraham their numbers were going to expand. And they began to proliferate in such degrees that the Pharaoh of Egypt finally said, we got to do something with these Israelites. They're going to outnumber us before long. And if we ever have an adversary that comes in and wants to fight us, these Israelites are going to side with our enemies and they're going to take us over. So we're going to turn them into slaves. So that's where we are today. This slavery of the children of Israel, the Hebrews, had lasted now for four centuries. It's a long time. 400 years. And now finally, remember the readings I believe we had in the last couple of weeks where we read about this little baby named Moses who was placed in this tar-lined basket, put in the bulrushes. Pharaoh's daughter sees him, takes him as her own. He ends up becoming the prince of Egypt. And then he sees his Hebrew brother being mistreated by an Egyptian soldier. He kills the Egyptian soldier. He gets found out. He flees into the wilderness. And at that point, he probably thinks, well, you know, at least I got out with my life. Everybody else is still in slavery, but I got out alive. And for 40 years, he was out wandering in the wilderness, tending the herds of his father-in-law, Jethro, until that day that he wandered up on the mountain and he sees something that he just couldn't believe. And that was this bush that was on fire but was not burning up. And he hears this voice, Moses, 
Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And the voice of God said, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. And then God tells him, well, I'm hearing the cries of my children. I want you to know I haven't forgotten them. The, they're being mistreated in Egypt, and I'm going to set them free. And at that point, Moses is jumping up and down. Good, it's about time. And then God tells Moses, and you're the one I'm selecting that's going to set him free. It's going to be through you that I'm going to do this work. God always works through a person. And Moses was the man of the hour. He didn't want to be the man of the hour. He was trying to find somebody else to do it. He was making all kinds of excuses. I can't talk. I mean, you know, I've already been up there. They don't like me in Pharaoh's court too much. And God says, everybody that was against you has died. Go in there and tell them what's going on. And tell them that the Lord is instructing them to let my people go. And so Moses does that. And the Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm not going to have any of that. Matter of fact, if your people have so much time on their hands as to go out in the wilderness and worship God, I'm going to give them some more work to do. So now instead of having the straw brought in for them to make their bricks, they're going to have to go out and get their own straw and make their bricks. And they're going to have to make the same amount of bricks that they did before. And the children of Israel were not very happy with Moses. They said, we were better off before you ever came on the scene here. Sometimes we like to be slaves. Sometimes we like to be in bondage because that's what we know. That's all we know. God wants to set us free. Sometimes it comes with a price. We're not always willing to pay the price. Sometimes we have to give up something of our own to get to the promised land. So Moses is unrelenting, and he does exactly what God tells him to do. You know the story where God starts to visit these plagues upon the children or the, the folks in Egypt, where we know that the first plague was where the river was turned into blood. All the water in Egypt turned into blood. Then came a plague of frogs that overran the country. Then third came gnats. Now I want somebody to tell me after the service if you know why they put a G in front of the word gnat because it just doesn't look right. But that's how it's spelled. G-N-A-T. We all know what gnats are. Those little pesky. I, mean, I got to find out someday why did God create gnats? What purpose do they serve other than to irritate people? Anyway, then came flies. I've got a question about flies, too. And fifth came pestilence on livestock. Then boils, number six, on the Egyptians. Only part of those. Boils, that doesn't sound very bad. Seventh came severe storms with devastating hail. Killed people and destroyed the crops. What crops were left then were eaten by a swarm of locusts on the eighth plague. And then the ninth came days of deep darkness. Three days of that. Every time the plague came, Moses, tell, Moses tells Pharaoh, hey, if you let my people go, we're going to pull back on this plague. And Pharaoh says, you know what? Whatever it takes, just get rid of this plague. As soon as the plague's gone, Pharaoh says, nah, I changed my mind. Happened nine times. Finally, the tenth time, God says, he had his chance, but now we're going to break him. And that's exactly what he did when he said, we are going to kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt. Who doesn't have this blood over their doorpost in the lintel. And you know, it's funny that that applied to the Israelites as well. The Israelites, if they hadn't put the blood on their door, they would have had the same consequences. So by then, the children of Israel, the Israelites, the Hebrews living in Egypt in bondage and slavery, they realized that Moses was indeed God's appointed prophet, his appointed leader, and that's exactly what happened. The plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians, so the, uh, the children of Israel didn't have to deal with them. They just somehow bypassed them. But this last one was for everybody, potentially, unless you had that blood on the borders. It's the only one where the Israelites were at risk, you could say. Why was that? Well, I think it was because even the Israelites, though they were God's chosen people, they were still not without sin themselves. Some of them had even crossed over and were worshiping Egyptian gods. So God made it real clear that this is how it's going to be. And you read, we just read the explicit directions on how to do the dinner that night. On the 10th day of the new month that God had ordained, they're going to go out and get this lamb, whether it's a goat or a sheep. They're going to have them for four days. On that fourth day at twilight, they're going to slaughter it. And they're going to roast it over a fire. And they're going to eat it that night. And then they're going to be ready to roll. Because guess what? The angel of death's coming to town. And Pharaoh's going to say, go ahead and get out. 
and they got to be ready to go when Pharaoh says to go. He might change his mind. So they were ready to go. They did everything they were told to do. But the way they were saved was one thing and one thing only. And it was the blood. An unblemished, perfect sheep or goat had to give its life to save those people. Had that blood not been on those doorposts, the angel of death would have visited that house. And that's exactly what happened. So, there's a lot of correlation on this story to what we find later in God's Word. You know, the direction that God gave the Israelites here, if you go back down here to Exodus 12, verse 14, says, This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. This is not a one-time deal. You're going to have to remember this. This is a huge night. Think about this. Now, it's being observed even today some, what, 2,500 years later, maybe 3,000 years later, we are still observing Passover. It's one of the key holidays in the Jewish tradition. There are some Christians that celebrate and remember Passover. It usually occurs every year in March. And so Jesus himself remembered Passover. And that occurred the week that we recall the Holy Week. Remember when Jesus went into Jerusalem on that donkey? And that was in the week of Passover. Now, Jesus didn't just come to celebrate or observe Passover, but he came to be our Passover because Jesus knew that it was his destiny. Now, he was going to be that spotless, blameless, sinless lamb of God. He was going to give his blood so that the angel of death would pass over those who believed in him so that we would not have to die. We would not have to be slaves to our sin and bondage to our habits, our hang-ups, our addictions, whatever they might be, but that he came to set us free from that, not only here on earth, but to give us eternal life. So that's what Jesus' destiny was. When he went in there on that day, he wasn't like going in there without knowing what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. There was no coincidence that he came at Passover because he came to be our Passover lamb. I wanted to read this out of the 19th chapter of the book of John where it says it was about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover and Pilate then told the people, here is your king. That was Jesus. So that was right at the day of Passover when Jesus was handed over and was crucified on that on that Good Friday that we, we celebrate now. There is another scripture passage that, that talks about this found in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 where it says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So the Passover that we just read about in Exodus was a precursor to what we are going to find today through Jesus Christ. And remember, we are to remember this event. It's not just to be something that's tucked away, but it's something we should relive. And to remember that God came out of his love for us to set us free. He's heard us. He's heard our cries. He knows us. And he wants us to have life the way he intended it, which is to live in freedom, not in bondage, not in slavery, but in, bond, in freedom from sin, so that we're not caught up in it, but now we've been set free. That's what this is all about. Now, today we have a very important event here that we're going to get to celebrate for the first time in quite a while, since I believe March the 8th. March the 1st, I think. It's Communion Sunday. And we got some communion elements. I hope everybody got their communion elements today as you walk in. If not, if you could let us know, we'll have someone to bring them to you here in just a moment. If, did anyone not pick up the little pre-packaged communion elements? Looks like everybody got them. Did you guys get some? Okay. Well, I wanted to share this part here as we as we prepare for this time, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important that we remember that Jesus Christ knew what was going to happen. And he gave directions for his followers, just like God gave directions for the children of Israel to remember Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the one who was shed for us. He was innocent, but he died for us anyway. He was blameless, he was sinless, but he still died for us. He did it willingly, though, as opposed to the animal sacrifice, which had to be repeated every year. 
because that was only going to go so far. Jesus came to be our sacrifice once and for all. Once he died for, for us on, the, on that cross, the sacrifices were over. He paid the price once and for all. So today, as we go about our communion, we remember the words of the scripture where we read that our Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Again, that whole idea of remembering. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, the whole idea here, I think, that, that we don't want to lose sight of is that the Bible makes it clear we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We don't stand on our own righteousness before God. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross for us. He substituted himself for us. He took our place. You know, if I am coaching a basketball team, there's five players on the team on the floor at any time. And I say, hey, Johnny, you go in and take Jimmy's place. Johnny goes in and takes Jimmy. Johnny substitutes for Jimmy. But Johnny's in now. He's taken over. Jesus substituted for us. That should have been me up on that cross. I should have been any, any one of us up on that cross. But Jesus told us to get off of the cross. He went up into our place on the cross. He died for our sins so that we now will have the forgiveness of sins that he bought for us with his blood. So now the angel of death and judgment has passed over us, and we're free. We need to live like we're free, but not free to go out and do things that are against God's will. I mean, we're free to do anything we want. But we don't want to do that. We want to live in freedom to serve the Lord, to obey him, not out of feelings of obligation or trying to earn our righteousness, but do it because of our great love for him. Christ loved us while we were yet sinners. You know, that was his great love for us, and he died on that cross for us. So today we come to the table not because we must, but because we may, not because we're strong, but because we're weak. We don't come from any goodness on our part, but because of God's mercy and his grace and his help. We come because we love the Lord a little, and we would love to be more committed to him, to love him even more. And we come to meet the risen Christ, for we are Christ's body. So, along that line, when we have our song here, you can just, if you haven't already taken the communion elements, you can do that as you're listening. And just remember the goodness of God, how Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of everything that happened back in Genesis, where the Passover was first started. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Amen. I come with joy to meet my Lord, forgiven, loved, and free, in awe and wonder to recall his life laid down for me, his life laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near, to find as all are fed the new community of love in Christ's communion.
bread in Christ's communion bread. As Christ breaks bread and bids us share, each proud division ends. The love that made us makes us one, and strangers now are friends. And stranger now are friends. And thus with joy we meet our Lord, his presence always near. Is in such friendship better known, we see and praise him here. We see and praise him here. Together met, together bound, we'll go our different ways. And as his people in the world, we'll live and speak his praise. We'll live and speak his praise. We're now going to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life in the last we will be visiting Moses for the next we're going to be hanging out with Mo and I think we'll find out that he has a lot to teach us you know Moses had one thing that we can maybe some of us relate to he had sometimes he, he got his anger got a little bit too the best of it. His anger got a little, a little too hot. And so you'll see through all this that Moses kind of mellowed out a little bit over the years. But next week we're going to read the story of the time that Moses led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. So you don't want to miss that. I'd like to say that Charlton Hester would be here to be our special guest, but that's probably not going to happen. But it's still a story that we want to think about and to remember. So thank you all again for being here today. It's wonderful to see you. Have a good, safe Labor Day. And we have one last song. When I want to be a Christian, I'm a poor Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want
like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. In my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my I think that last verse sums it up pretty well. I want to be one like Jesus in my heart. And that is that we love everybody. Whether they're good to us or that they're not so good to us. Just love people. And God will bless that and everyone. Let's conclude in prayer today as we depart. Father in heaven, again, I thank you for this time where we come to just worship you, to think about you, or to be inspired by you. And I pray your blessing now on those that are here in this room, those that couldn't make it, Lord, that pray for healing, for those who have a need for physical touch, Lord, those that need maybe just some of your peace and their anxiety, Lord, those that are struggling through relationships or emotions of one kind or another, Lord, those that have other kinds of needs, Lord, just help us to relax and to lean into you. And help us to follow you through this wilderness that we're going through right now. We know you will give us through to the other side. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.